so hi everyone, my name is Luke. I'm the CEO at Thunken. Uh, so Thunken is a consulting company based in Washington DC. We specialize in data science and um, scientific data. Um, so publications, patents, clinical trials, drug approvals, financial reports, uh, and more recently we got into the field of health metrics. Um, so we're not the first ones, obviously. Um, there's Altmetric, ALM, from Plus, um, Crossref, even Data, Plum. Um, all these are very, and if I forgot one, I'm sure there also are great projects. Um, but diversity is good, generally speaking, especially in a, such a small field with not a lot of players. And uh, we think we can do even better, also by sharing the, the workload. So the big questions, are your Altmetrics alt enough? Um, no. Um, and the answer will always be no, because there's always something we're not measuring. Um, so metrics, and I often talk about alt metrics, but it works about science metrics, bibliometrics, and any kind of metrics and statistics that you do. Uh, metrics are a sampling game. So sampling and selection biases are very important. Your metrics are only as good as your sample. Um, and I often talk about biases and selection biases. And when you talk about a bias, people assume it's a property of the data. So I've started talking about discrimination um, because that's the consequence of selection biases. If you only track data in English, for example, uh, people who publish, review, teach in other languages will not be included in those databases, and that's not OK. If you don't track some types of documents, they are not included, and so they get zeros in terms of scores. Uh, well, there should be a number. Um, so diversity and fairness, generally speaking, must be an integral part of the projects that we do in terms of metrics and statistics. Um, and why should we care? Why should we care about you know, low frequency signals, languages for which we really don't have much data, um, document types that are seldom used on the web? Well. We should care because it's not too late for metrics, science metrics, and health metrics. And there are two books that I really recommend. Um, Weapons of Math Destruction by Cathy O'Neill and Automating Inequality by Virginia Eubanks. And those books are about completely different tasks and applications of uh, statistical modeling where things went terribly, terribly wrong. Uh, we're talking about people losing their jobs, people losing medical coverage. So the consequences are obviously different, but as a community, I think we can learn from those failures to try to improve uh, what we do on a daily basis. Um, so the scientific community, we all know that, and you can see it at the conference, is global and diverse. So our corpus needs to be global and diverse. So we need to index all languages, all document types, all identifiers, everything that we see, everything that there is on the web, we need to track it to be able to report it, measure the attention that those contents get. Um, and when I talk about the work that we do on Cobalt Metrics, the, the most frequent feedback, negative feedback that we get is, but there's already so much. There's so much on altmetric.com in Crossref even data and other databases. Um, does it really matter if we add 0.5% you know, extra data uh, is it worth doing another project to add 0.5% extra data? And it does matter because it's not about the global number of citations or mentions that you add, but that 0.5% of data on a global scale might include 100% of the scientific production of someone who you know, doesn't publish in peer-reviewed journals or doesn't publish in English, and that is not currently included in altmetric.com, uh, Plum, and I'm naming names, but you know, uh, it's a general issue in our community, I think. Um, and the main point is that if you have a list of languages that you track, if you have a list of document types that you track, if you have a list of types of identifiers that you track, then you're defining what is citable. Because if you're not tracking it, it's never going to be measured. And if you define what is citable, you define what is worth producing in a way. And that's not OK and that's not fair, especially in this day and age we've, where we have natural language processing, we can do tons and tons of data mining and text mining in a matter of seconds. Um, so I'll talk a bit more about what we do with Cobalt Metrics. Um, but just a note about terminology, um, to me, and in Cobalt Metrics, a citation, a backlink, a mention, an event, a URI, a URL, um, that's the same thing. I track stuff that references stuff somewhere on the web. Um, then you know we can talk about that, but I don't think we should spend too much time 
distinguishing like I mentioned in an event, for example. Um, so I often talk about different languages, but uh, today I'm going to focus on the way we cite papers because that's the you know, nitty gritty of what we do when we do metrics. Um, so the ideal identifier should be persistent and fair, so findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. Um, and that's cute, but that's not how you know, it works on the web. Uh, we all copy paste from the address bar of our browsers. Um, we all do it, I do it all the time, even if I give talk about not copy pasting from the address bar of your browser. Um, and so in that example, there's a DOI, um, a short DOI and a short URL that all refer to the same paper. Um, so as the end user, it's fine, you're clicking and you get to the paper and you're done. When you're building metrics, you want to make sure that with whatever URI is used in the data gets linked to that paper for the author and the contributors to get credit and for the attention to be measured accurately. Um, and you often hear conversation about, oh, you know, we got DOIs. Uh, we're safe and we're cool and we can do many things. Um, DOIs are good, but there are billions and billions of documents on the web um, that will never get DOIs or any other kind of fancy persistent identifiers. Um, there are old legacy documents and we're never, I mean, I think that no one is assigning DOIs to old publications. That'd be cool, but um, no one is gonna pay for that. Um, the gray literature, so non-formal, non-peer-reviewed, outside of the you know, commercial publishing um, ecosystem, and then the rest of the web. And the rest of the web is an insane amount of data that we need to track. For example, in our case, we do metrics uh, mostly for tech transfer companies. So they want to track innovation, whatever that means, from publications to patents to clinical trials to drug approval to market data and financial reports. Um, so I can talk to that community and ask you to use you know, DOIs and machine readable identifiers. I cannot call the Securities and Exchange Commission in the US and say, okay, your website is meh. Could you use DOIs for financial reports? That's never gonna work. Um, and there are also tons of documents with DOIs that get cited, but the citation doesn't include a DOI. So it's nice to have you know, good practices and identifiers that are good, but we all need to use them to make sure that the web as a whole is interoperable. Um, so a few words about the work that we do in Cobalt Metrics. So we track all, everything that we see, we track it. So all URLs, all URIs, all typed identifiers, we track everything in every language. Um, I come from natural pro language processing, so I know how ambiguous natural language can be, and we don't do natural language search. Um, so if you want to search by title, name, go to Crossref, get the DOI, and come back to us and get the data. Uh, we will never, and I swear, we will never create new identifiers because <sighs> there are too many of them. Uh, and we'll never create new scores, which is a bit counterintuitive for a metrics company, uh, but I'll talk more about that. Um, we're really trying to decouple data aggregation from data analysis, so in a sense we're closer to cross reference even data than to altmetric. We're never gonna you know, make another donut or a score that summarizes um, you know, scientific production, because it's never a good experience to summarize a person, a body of work, or an institution to a single number. Uh, especially when it happens to you, and once we have a single number, we start comparing and ranking, and I don't think um, that goes in the right direction in terms of evaluating impact and research. Um, so I often talk about non-canonical identifiers, and in that sense, it's really any identifier that is not 100% fair, so going back to those principles of infinable, interoperable, and everything. Uh, and there are three types that I'd like to talk about more today. Short URLs, proxy URLs, and sci-hub URLs, which are close to proxy URLs, but um, it's a thing of its own. Um, and non-canonical URLs are everywhere. So that's an example from Bitcoin. The main paper on Bitcoin is a white paper um, that's available on the web on bitcoin.org. It never got formally published or peer-reviewed. It doesn't have any DOI. So if you try to track, and we've done that, um, information like metrics on Bitcoin, blockchain and everything on Web of Science and Scopus, um, you get tons and tons of mentions that are not unified by any kind of identifier. And if you go to Google Scholar and you get the publication, the first thing is that um, the website is academia for some reason, because I guess they just have no idea that Bitcoin.org exists, so that's the best source that they can have. 
Um, and you know, papers that are very influential sometimes don't have nice metadata. And in that example, there are 500 different versions, 5,000 citations, and 50,000 uh, results for Bitcoin. So that paper created a new field of research that everyone knows about. Um, and there's no DOI to cite it. So you need to default to uh, low-level hypertext crawling um, and what I call hypertext necromancy to find the links between the content. Um, and yeah, I've talked about that. URL shortening was an awful, awful idea. Um, so those three, four um, URLs are URLs to the same um, document. So you have the, the final URL or the most canonical URL on the top, then the URL with the DOI, then a short link, and then a short DOI. And there's, as you can see, no way to compute the short link or the short DOI from the other two. So you really need to have huge, huge databases because uh, that's not a relationship you can compute on the fly. That's something you need to learn and you need to fill um, you know, disks and disks and servers and servers with information about short URLs. Uh, so please do not use short URLs. Um, and so we know that exists, but then we need to have some kind of understanding of how big of a problem it is. So we've started measuring what we call vulnerable citations. And vulnerability in that context is the number of steps between the URL that was used to cite and the document that is cited. Because every step, every link in that chain can break at some point, especially with short URLs that are maintained by commercial um, you know, shorteners, many of them have failed over the years, and um, there's not necessarily, I mean, now there is, but back in the day, there was no escrow system to release the database if the company fails. So we have tons of links in the wild that we cannot resolve to the final destination anymore. Um, so that's a huge database. We have access to 6 billion pairs of short URLs and expanded URLs that are not only scientific, but, um, you know, we get everything there is on the web. And so we have very preliminary results for a few major stakeholders using a sample of almost 2 billion short URLs and domains listed in EasyProxy and Wikipedia. And the problem is, how do you define the scientific web and the domains that you want to analyze? So we got the major publishers and platforms, and we got the domains that they use. Uh, because for example, Elsevier doesn't only use Elsevier.com. Um, and before I show the result, the next step is going to be to do partnerships with Bitly and other companies like that to get usage data. So not only about the URLs that exist, but about how many times they were clicked and accessed to see really how big of a problem it is for metrics in general. Um, so we got results for Medline, Springer, Elsevier, Wiley, Sage, DOI.org, and Taylor and Francis. Um, so those are URLs to actual publications, not just Elsevier.com or About Us pages or sitemaps, really to the scientific content. Um, and what we see is that there are at least, because it's a sample and that's only a third of the short URLs that we have access to, there are hundreds of thousands of citations that can break at any time on the web. And the, the only two shorteners that are really going to leave for a while, I think, are doi.org, because you know, otherwise we're really in a bad situation, <laughs> and uh, Bitly, because that's the main company that does, and maybe tiny URL and a few others, but uh, you know, the smaller ones and appearing and disappearing all the time. Um, so we need a way to fix that, and we need to think that when you're doing metrics and collecting data on Twitter, for example, every time you post a link on Twitter, Twitter changes the URL to their own shortening service because they can do tons of tracking from that. Um, so if you use the API, you get the first redirection, but you don't get the final destination. So just know that your sample is always a SEP sample, um, and we don't know if that's like a constant factor that we can ignore. So until we can prove that it's a constant factor that we can ignore, we actually need to process the data to make sure that we have everything that we need to track. Um, and Sci-Hub, a few words about Sci-Hub. I love Sci-Hub, not because I think it's a solution to anything, but just because it's fun. And you know the reactions that you get when you mention Sci-Hub are really fun. Um, and what we see is that, and I, I love that fact, Sci-Hub URLs are now used in the reference sections of peer-reviewed publications. Which is super cool for reviewers because you can access everything that is cited. It's awesome for readers because you can access everything that is cited. Um, not so good for publishers, even though they should be really interested in usage data from Sci-Hub. 
you know, regardless of the legal status, it's been used, so we need to monitor it and to track it and to see exactly how it's used. Um, one thing about Sci-Hub is that domains are often suspended or um, deactivated for many different reasons, and that creates dead links all the time. So in Cobalt Metrics, we decided to support URLs that use any of Sci-Hub's domains, whether they are still active or deactivated. Um, and supporting dead links and deactivated domains, generally speaking, and not only for Sci-Hub, is very, very important in the context of metrics. And I, so I'm a linguist, originally. And I compare that to studying extinct languages. Even though no one uses them and no one produces content anymore, we still need to understand what was said and what was used and the context in which it was used at the time. Um, and nothing lasts forever on the web, um, except for your MySpace profile. So what can we do about all those non-canonical citations that risk breaking at any time? Um, so I don't have a true answer to that, but a few pointers. Um, from discussions over the past few weeks and the Altmetrics conference, I feel like we're moving to what I would call second generation Altmetrics, also because I need buzzwords. Um, we're a new company, we need you know, fun words to talk about what we do. Um, so the first step will be to just collaborate and share the workload. I have no interest in redoing the work that Altmetric.com has been doing. I have no interest in crawling Twitter, uh, Reddit, Facebook, all those big sources. We've done it on Wikipedia to show that you know what we can do compares and even um, is even better than what Alpentric does. Uh, for example, we track almost 200 languages while well, they do three. Um, and, um, and then I'm interested in you know, the usage of Sci-Hub and illegal downloads, and we're looking into torrents and uh, all the stuff that no one else is interested in at the moment. Um, so that's the first part, and we started talking with Altmetric, but I really don't know where this is going. And then decoupling data aggregation from data analysis, and that I think is very important, and it's what uh, Joe and others have been doing with cross survey and data to really um, have a huge database of information and then compute the metrics. And I think in terms both of the you know, technical implementation, but also in terms of the philosophy of what we're doing, you cannot collect data and turn data into scores at the same time. It's just as problematic as being a publisher and being a metrics platform at the same time. Um, I think we need to have different actors in the field with different responsibilities and different interests that do work with the same data sets, but we do need to make sure that we keep things separate to you know, make sure we don't transform the data too much and manipulate numbers. Um, and that's about it. Uh, CobaltMetrics.com is available. It's free. We just have a cap on the number of requests you can send every day um, so that our servers don't crash. Uh, but if you're interested in getting more data, feel free to ask, and uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Is it working? Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, I'm. I'm wondering. So. What do you think is the role of, so you're talking about just uh, data aggregation and data analysis. And so we've been trying to do very similar work and basically just um, provide the connections between URLs and Facebook graph objects. Mm -hmm. So now my question is, because Facebook, we're all interested in Altmetric, Altmetrics people are interested in Facebook. Um, what about the black box of many of these platforms and even if we do the best we can do on the side of collecting links, aggregating links to uh, DOIs and articles, um, Facebook does weird things, uh, and they like to change seemingly everything every few months. So how should we deal with that? Um, ignore Facebook? No. Um, no, there's. I have no real answer about Facebook. But generally speaking, I think um, you know, it's fine for publishers and end users to use DOIs and those you know, more um, fancy identifiers. When you collect metrics and you track citations, any mention that you see is a citation. That's my point of view. So then you just collect everything that you see. And on top of that, you have a huge knowledge graph of identifiers that are equivalent because they point to the same publication or because this was authored by that or this was published in that journal. Um, and I think if you keep collecting information on one side, 
and you update the knowledge graph as Facebook changes, well, I don't really know about Facebook internals, but um, you know, I think if we decorrelate even more uh, what we observe on the websites and you know, what we can uh, do with that data that we just collected, um, it's also much more interesting because we can split the workload. Uh, you're going to monitor Facebook, I'm going to monitor something else, but then we have one huge knowledge graph which is also powered by the publishers and you know, other content creators to get the ORCID idea of the authors and everything. So um, no real answer, but just ignore Facebook. It's not interesting anyway. And they collect tons of data, so yeah. <laughs> I just want to ask how you define a citation. Um, a document that refers to another document, whether that's a peer-reviewed publication that cites the usual way another peer-reviewed publication, or whether that's a post on Reddit that mentioned an Instagram account. To me, those are the same thing. It's very low level. You know, a hyperlink um, is all I need. Um, then we're collecting tons of data. Most of, them is, most of it is never going to be used, and that's fine because it's always easier to filter out than to try to you know, make up for the stuff that you haven't tracked in the first place. Um, but very, very broad definition of what a citation is. Last question. Well, thanks. Thank <laughs>